We have a test next week. Did you notice that? <laughs> that is <a> good. <laughs> The weekend. Good? Go outside? We have a very nice weekend. Good weekend to be outside. <clears throat> too short? Too short? Yeah. We didn't have no extended weekend. No, we didn't weekend. have. No, we didn't. No, we did not. By the end of this month, we'll be halfway through the semester. <laughs> yeah, that's hard. Yeah. That means that I have been here for more than two months. <laughs> You've been here for more than one three months. Three training, but I have been in junior. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's so funny because by the time everyone arrived, I already had it on for all the stuff. I was like, you just got here. I'm like, you just got here. I have been here for more than two months. Ms. Allison? Do we have a ton of coming today? Alice, what do you see? Hey, Allison, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. What do you see? On, what do you see? Um, the ABC video. Okay, good. All right. All right, Jonna. Hello, how are you? All right, how are you? Good. <clears throat> okay. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. All right. I just want to introduce this little um, learning paradigm with you all. This is a version of of the delayed response task. We may not even get to this today. Well, okay. We're probably not going to get to this today, but that's okay. Because it's quite a, quite a ways down in the list. But let's check this out. Let's see how the monkey does. This monkey is ridiculous. Wait, you see what he has, what this monkey has to do, and how good this monkey is.
We can get into all kinds of philosophical questions about that. I don't really want to, but okay, so okay. Oops. Now for the fun part. Let's see. Okay, I am not a monkey, so it's hard for me to actually figure out what I'm supposed to do here. Okay, Alex, what do you see? I can see the, Yeah, I can see the PowerPoint now. Beautiful. Good. Thank you. All right. Well, that although the monkey did way better than <clears throat> what the monkeys that we're going to uh, the data we're going to look at did. It's something that's called the delayed response task. So the, the whole thing, the whole point of it is, yes, they can learn the pattern. Um, sometimes it's much more simple than that. It's just showing a picture. You have to pick the right picture out of a group of pictures to get the to get the the food tree. <clears throat> um, and then they introduce some sort of a distraction or a long delay in between when they show the picture, the target picture, and then whenever they, they are given the group of pictures to, pick, to choose from. So I just wanted to introduce that task. That's a very, that would assess learning, like the ability to learn something and recall in the moment. Definitely we'll get that later. I don't know about today, but so let's see here. Does it work? Nice. So two major <clears throat> two major classes of handles, receptors. One are called the ionotropic receptors. And they're activated. They allow the movement of ions, right? We talked about that was what we ended with on Thursday. <clears throat> and I introduced to you some examples, right? So if we activate nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, the ligand binds to those, <clears throat> the neurotransmitter binds to those, or a drug may bind to those. You activate the receptor, the receptor opens, and allows for the movement of ions in one direction or another, either into or out of the cell. And we talked about these different kinds. Um, if you take acetylcholine receptor, what happens there? If I activate that, boom, done. Sodium moves in. Sodium moves in. All right, NMDA. Receptor. Okay, Emily? Uh, calcium can come in. Calcium can come in. So those would be examples of an EPSP or an IPSP. 
good, right? We're, we're, we're making the inside of that neuron more positive. What about GABA? Seven. Uh, four identifiers. Okay. EPSP or IPSP? So chloride? Chloride is negative. Good. So does that inhibit or does that excite? That would inhibit. Good. Awesome. Okay, good. <clears throat> okay, Allison, you need to hang on to your hat now. Because we're going to talk about some crazy ones. So I'm going to move your I'm going to move your face. Can I move your face? Yes. <laughs> and move your face over here. Let me shrink you a little bit. I can't I can't shrink you anymore. Let's put you right there. All right. These are metabotropic. And so metabo basically means that we're going to be changing to lead to a change in the shape of the transmembrane regions. We're going to talk about what that means. Leads to an activation of a G protein inside the cell. So these are called G protein coupled receptors. GPCR. And the metabo comes from, it's linked to. going to change or modify some sort of a chemical messenger inside of those neurons. We call that a second messenger. Okay, so that's where the metabo comes from. And hopefully this will all make sense once we get through this. So a G protein coupled receptor means that there's two parts to this. There's two parts. Let's talk about the receptor first. This is what we're more, we're more familiar with what a receptor is at this point, right? So a receptor is a protein in the plasma membrane to which is bound a specific molecule, signaling molecule. That's what a receptor is, right? And, and in our case, that specific molecule is going to be the neurotransmitter for now. And Unlike, unlike the ionotropic receptors, which are comprised of these five subunits, five little components that form the channel, the, the, the G protein coupled receptor, so the receptor, remember, that's where the neurotransmitter is going to bind, or the drug, right? The receptor. It's, it has comprised of these, it's one protein, so it's only one protein, and it's comprised of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven regions, sort of, that cross that extend from the outside of the plasma membrane to the inside. That's what they mean by transmembrane regions. So there are seven of these, four, five, six, seven, there are seven of these in this protein. Transmembrane, yep. So it's basically means that the like the electrical signal or the neurotransmitter travels through all these different parts? Nope. They're, they're anchored in there. Mm -hmm. 
the, that, now, this protein also has a region outside. So in this yellow region, that's where the extracellular fluid is. So there's going to be a region on this protein where the neurotransmitter binds. And then in here, you see this red region. This is the region where the G protein is. This is on the inside of the cell. That's why it's called a G protein coupled receptor. So what happens then is, let's say this little hook shaped structure right up here is where the neurotransmitter binds. The neurotransmitter binds to that leads to changes in the shape of some or some portion of these transmembrane regions. They begin to shift and move, shift and move. And when they shift and move, this leads to, in some cases, it's going to lead to activation of a G protein, which is inside this cell. So these are kind of funky. But the, 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 ner the neurotransmitter is always going to activate the receptor. And this is going to lead to activation of the particular G protein. And then the G protein, then the G protein is inside the cell. It's going to have some effect inside the cell. So, Allison, this particular class of receptors, it's got all kinds of parts. It has the the, the region where, so the protein to which the neurotransmitter binds, that's the receptor. All of this is the receptor. And then down in here, there's going to be a G protein. And that G protein can have different kinds of effect inside the cell. Let's stop there for a second. Question. This is really different from the ion channel. Ion channel is very simple. Opens, closes. Let's think you in or out. So essentially it's like there's a, se a second step being added. Instead of just the, the ion channels opening, there's, there's an additional protein that um that the that's there's binding going on with so you mean inside the diff, there's another protein inside the cell is that what you're referring to well what i mean so when there's the when the binding to the active site happens um oh. That's, you know, the G protein is then activated. Right. So first you act good. So first you activate the receptor, then you activate the G protein inside the cell. Good. Other questions? Other questions? Other questions? Julie? So first you activate the receptor. And then you activate the G protein in the cell. Yep. And then what does the G protein do? Depends on what kind of G protein. So let's talk about some examples. One thing that can happen is that.
This G protein can move. Blah, 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 blah. It could, it could lead, lead to, it can activate, open a potassium channel, which leads to potassium leaving the neuron. So what kind of effect is that going to have on that neuron, inhibitory or excitatory? Can also lead to the opening of calcium channels, which leads to calcium influx. And calcium can actually then do other things inside of the cell. It can activate, bind to different proteins, which then serve as chemical signals inside the cell. So Or it can just simply render that cell, render the membrane potential of that cell more possible. But this can happen through the movement of, so what happens is, here's my G protein, no, here's my receptor, it gets activated, then the G protein moves as a phosphate usually to an ion channel, and then the ion channel opens. Yep. Is the G protein like on the Yep. Got it. Yes. The third thing that can happen is that it can, the G protein can activate or inhibit certain enzymes. And we're going to keep this really simple. Activates enzymes oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, what ends up happening is that inside of the cell, you get an increase in this molecule, which is called cyclic AMP. And that cyclic AMP then has. by mechanisms we're not going to talk about in this class, has an excitatory effect in the neuron. So that's one kind of G protein, can activate a particular enzyme, leads to an increase in cyclic AMP. You can activate a completely different kind of G protein. Inhibits an enzyme that has the opposite effect. It can reduce cyclic AMP. in very simple terms, then has an inhibitory effect inside the cell. So because we're, we're, we're changing the, or increasing or decreasing the expression of these particular kind of signaling molecules, that's why, that's what really has the, the effect on the postsynaptic neuron either makes it more likely to generate an action potential or less likely. And these are, the cyclic EMP is an example of a second messenger. Why? Because 
the neurotransmitter is the first messenger, right? And then the cyclic AMP, which is the signal that's produced inside the cell, that's called the second messenger. But you need this intermediary, this G, this G protein coupled receptor, you need it to be activated and then activate that G protein, which does its thing inside. Stop there for a second. Because we'll, we're going to talk about drugs that increase cyclic AMP, decrease cyclic AMP. So I'm only introducing this to you because I want you to be thinking oh, that's going to inhibit these neurons. Or that's going to excite these neurons. So we'll get Julie then. then Julie? Okay. What is like, what this cyclic AMP like besides? Oh man, um, and these it, it, it's part of it, it's part of these very complex signaling pathways that are inside of inside of cells. Um, yeah, it's very complicated how it, how it actually works. So sometimes. Sometimes it leads to increases in gene expression. Sometimes it leads to decreases in gene expression. Other signaling molecules. Um, yeah, it's. Okay. Yeah, Julie. The, I'm trying to figure out how to word this. The G protein is just like very active. That's all the involved in like the electron transfer, right? Six of GMP. Gene mm -hmm. proteins are not. There's different enzymes involved with the electron transfer. Um, but I know I know that um, there are there are proteins, there are enzymes that are embedded in there, but they're not considered G proteins. Cool. All right. So two big, two major, two major categories, right? Ionotropic and metabotropic. It can either increase or decrease the activity of the postsynaptic neuron. And well, we've seen that. Metabotropic receptors can also lead to the movement of ions. Or they can activate, they can increase or decrease the presence of other chemical signals inside the neurons. These ones take longer to get going because there's more moving parts. Have a more prolonged effect once they're activated. Okay, speaking of activated, so we want to be able to turn these things off, right? We don't just want this signal to be going and going and going. So we need to be able to inactivate <clears throat> a neurotransmitter. By the way, what are three ways? that the release of the neurotransmitter can be modified. Three ways that the neurotransmitter can be modified. Three ways, three ways, three ways. One is increasing the, uh, the flow of neurotransmitters. So like the rush of neurotransmitters. Okay, how do we do that? Uh... Like the free the frequency of the number of action potentials. Good. So if I increase frequency, I'm going to get increased neurotransmitter release. Good. What's another one? That um, you can decrease the um, resting potential or or, or the number of resting potential, the potential at which the the neuron must reach in order to release the neurotransmitter, the drug that can uh, lower that. Require amount of potential. Okay, you can do that. That that definitely would lower it. 
We hit three, we talked about three specific ones on Thursday, but that would definitely do it. Second one is the probability of whether or not that neuron is actually going to, the arrival of the action potential will lead to the release of neurotransmitter. What was number three? You got your hand up already. Um, so the neurotransmitter is inhibited by autoreceptors. Autoreceptor. Yep. So, so autoreceptors, that's related. Absolutely. Okay, good. What is an autoreceptor? What is an autoreceptor? Well, that would be a good. Um, it, you, yeah, Allison? I was going to say it's, it's located on the axon terminal and it's something that inhibits the flow of neurotransmitters. Okay, good. So, so when the autoreceptor is activated, it's always going to have an inhibitory effect. Always, always, always. Receptors, receptors are on the postsynaptic neuron. They can have either effect. Okay, good. So autoreceptors usually have an inhibitory or? Autoreceptors always have inhibitory. Okay. Always, always. Yeah. They're there to make sure that that's a feedback mechanism. So that way if the neurotransmitter release is too, there's too much, it begins to spill out from around the, the, the synapse and begins to activate those autoreceptors slows down neurotransmitter release. Okay, cool. So now let's inactivate this. So typically, neurotransmitters are, are oftentimes rapidly broken down by degradative enzymes. Enzymes are going to break these neurotransmitters down. And oftentimes, you find these enzymes in the, the postsynaptic neuron. So just to give you some examples, MAO stands for monoamine oxidase. MAO. MAOA breaks down norepinephrine. Down or up in that. MAOB breaks down dopamine. And just as a clue, anytime you see a molecule that ends in ACE, ASE, ASE, that's an enzyme that's going to break something down. That's a degradative enzyme. And it tells you what it's going to break down. So dopamine and norepinephrine, these are monoamine neurotransmitters. So that being the case, what does acetylcholine esterase? Break down. Acetylcholine. Yep. The drugs called monoamine oxidase inhibitors. MAOI, these were some of the more primitive. Um, older uh, antidepressant drugs, MAOIs. Which is the MAOI like inhibits the mono the MAO? Yep, yep. So a monoamine oxidase inhibitor would inhibit the uh, 
which means if we just if we inhibit it, for example. Given the, the monoamine oxidase, we can then increase the presence of the, those particular neurotransmitters in the synapse. That, that's one way to sort of inactivate the signal, right? We want to, we want to shut the signal down. Boom! Rapid, rapid. Um, response and then we want it to be on a microsecond basis. Second thing, second way, are reuptake by transporters. So the transporter, these are not vesicular transporters, but these are, when you hear the word transporter, I'm going to draw, here's the presynaptic, here's the postsynaptic, Transporters are going to be found on the pre synaptic membrane. These are transporters. Their job is to remove. The neurotransmitter from the cleft. So what happens is you get well. We'll get that to the next one. Next slide. We'll take a look at that. How it shot back, and they're always working. They're always working. They're always working. If there are extra excess neurotransmitter in the synapse. It'll bind to the protein and get, get transported back into the presynaptic terminal. So we've got the enzyme down here. We've got the receptor here. We've got autoreceptors here. There's all kinds of stuff going on. So it's, some of the neurotransmitter actually makes it to the receptor. The rest of it gets cleaned up. Now, let's talk about some drugs that we're probably more familiar with, at least hopefully not exper experientially. Cocaine. Cocaine blocks transporters for dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. It blocks them all. And serotonin, 5-HT, so cocaine. You get so much energy, you don't know what to do. Dopamine, norepinephrine, and 5-HT or serotonin. So we know that dopamine feels good, norepinephrine, I'm awake. Serotonin is also, I'm awake. So you're awake and you feel really good. Loxetine, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. This is another term, reuptake inhibitor. So this process of transporters, transporting the neurotransmitter back into the synapse, or back into the presynaptic neuron, that process is called reuptake. So when the transporter does its thing, that's called reuptake. So if we block 
transporters for serotonin. What's the, what's the effect? What's going to happen to serotonin in the synapse? It's going to increase it. So you give a drug that increases serotonin in the synapse, you get a relief from depression in certain populations of, of humans. Therefore, you conclude that low serotonin contributes to depression. Big broad stroke. Okay. All right. Don't worry about whether or not this, this drug is going to have high, higher drug has higher low abuse potential. I don't want you to think about that. All I want you to do is think about whether or not this particular drug would increase or decrease dopamine in the synapse. That's all I want you to think about. So what are these symbols all representing? So green is the receptor. Doesn't this look like a textbook? Isn't it nice? Anyone, you guys ever use BioRender, by the way? BioRender? Do you ever want to, if you ever need to make something that looks almost like, wow, that looks really good, how long did that take you? Literally five minutes using BioRender. It's free. It's great. It's probably like that, it's probably like that crack dealer program, right? Where they, it's free until they get enough people to do it, then they're going to start charging. But anyway, so these ones are the receptors. These pink ones look like the green ones, but they're not. So guess what they are? They're on the presynaptic, and they're outside the synapse. So what are these probably? Boom, autoreceptors, good. So the, the salmon colors are the autoreceptors, good. Okay. Purple, bluish purple. They have a binding site. They have a binding site for the um, for the neurotransmitter. And they're going to take that neurotransmitter back into the into the presynaptic normal. So these are probably what. These are the transporters, good. Yellow are going to be our vesicular transporters. We didn't really talk about these too much. Actually, we didn't talk about these at all. Vesicular transporters, but they're the vesicular transporter. So once the drug gets transported back into the synapse, the job of the vesicular transporter is then to, to transport it from cytosol inside the cell pop it back into the, ve the vesicle to get it ready for re-release. And the red, these are the degradative enzymes. Okay, degradative enzymes. So, all right. So let's see, you get your predictometers on. Oh, bad, bad moment. Okay. Felding. Nardil.
I, I guess I could have had old Kahoot for this. I, I didn't think I didn't feel like breaking out the breaking out the Kahoot for you guys. I'm sorry. Cephalopy, MAO inhibitor. Increase, decrease, no effect on dopamine. Should increase, increase the dopamine, yes. Oh, yes. We're just going to say it's going to, it has the potential to increase dopamine in the synapse. There is some, there are some studies indicating that this drug could have a little bit of an addiction potential. Some studies indicate that because of the potential to increase dopamine in the synapse. Okay. Amphetamine. This is an easy one. This stimulates dopamine release. Is that going to increase dopamine in the synapse? Absolutely. You get a whopping, whopping release of dopamine in the, in the, the synapse. He said, what cocaine does. What, what does cocaine do? Uh, it increases the serotonin. I'm sorry. Um, it blocks the transporters that go to the normal SSI serotonin. Okay, so that's going to block dopamine Due to dopamine in the synapse, increases it, right? And by the way, you probably know that these two drugs here are amphetamine or drugs, drugs in the amphetamine class as well as cocaine, very, 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 very highly addictive. drug I screwed up on Thursday. Apomorphine. Now, before we do, before we go into this, I want to go over sort of the note that I posted online. Apomorphine. At low doses, at low doses, it activates D2, which is a class of dopamine receptor, autoreceptor. At low doses. So what effect would low doses of beta morphine have on dopamine release? Increase, decrease, stay the same. What's that? Increase. Increase? Yeah. I'm activating these receptors right here. Good. Remember what other receptors do? Yeah. They always inhibit. Is 
the release. High dose, high dose. When you start bumping the dose up, it starts activating partially the regular dopamine receptor. You end up getting some dopamine like effect. It's not real strong, but it, you get some. But the high dose wouldn't really affect dopamine release. Right? So this is this is different. Low dose, then it's going to preferentially hit the, the only going to hit the receptors that are inhibiting dopamine release. It's going to go mm, stop. Or you get higher. Now you can inhibit a little bit, but you're going to be hitting these dopamine receptors down here, which are then. So then it ha it's going to have a dopamine-like effect. So you don't even necessarily need to release the neurotransmitter if you have a dopamine-like effect on the postsynaptic side. See that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now for the final one. This is the, this is the, this is the million dollar one. Drug called Reserpine. Maybe you guys read about that. Reserpine. Inhibits vesicular transport. Okay, I want you to stop and just think about that one for a second, for a few seconds, and think about what would be the long-term consequences of dopamine release, on dopamine release, of blocking the uptake of dopamine into sort of the recovery of dopamine into it. So think about that just for a few minutes. Think about that. Okay. So yeah, so let's think about this for okay, good. So um, I sort of dumped a whole bunch of stuff. So we're, we're stimulating. So we have action potential come down. We get dopamine release. We get reuptake into the into the axon terminal after it has its effect. But then ah ah, it actually makes that sound good. If you listen. They have experiments where they, they can hear the, the, the neurotransmitter going, ah, trying to get back into the vessel. Yeah. So eventually, then, we've got this axon terminal full of neurotransmitter, and none of it's in the vesicle. Very? It 
should over time completely um, reduce, significantly reduce dopamine release from that influence. I have a question. Yo. So it's it's re it makes sense that if there is an influx of dopamine in the um, the synaptic vesicle, it makes sense that it wouldn't be able to come out if the ve if the vesicular transporter is not working properly. So there would be an influx an influx of dopamine in the um, axon terminal, but a, a decrease of dopamine outside because it, it's not being able to be released. Got it. Did we follow that? You got it. Yes. Exactly. Because in order for the neurotransmitter to be released, what does it have to be packaged in? A vesicle. Um, and I want to get back to, let's take this stuff back a second. Jonna asked a question, I think it was you, Jonna, on Thursday about could you just block the calcium channel and the axon terminal? I think you asked that. Was that you? No, I was not that. And who was that who was it that asked that? Was it you, Julie? Probably. Maybe. Maybe. Allison, was it you? Better. I don't think it was. Okay. Well, Question, the answer is yes. There are drugs that they're trying to develop. These are actually, these are analgesic drugs or anti-nociceptive drugs that they're trying to develop to block the specific kind or category type of voltage-gated calcium channel that's found on the axon terminals of pain neurons. There are other drugs like cocaine. So when you hear A I N E, when you see that, AIN, maybe we've heard of another drug that has. Oh, I'm going to put cane over here. Let's see. What are some other drugs that end in, in cane? Anyone ever been to the dentist? Oh. Ah, <laughs> I saw the head going, you. Is it lidocaine? Lidocaine's another one. These are the cane pharmacologists. One of their properties is that they are sodium voltage gated sodium channel blockers. Voltage gated sodium channel blockers. So, how would this prevent a pain signal going from your mouth to your brain? Yep, yeah, um, We might count it. Yo, Al, do it. Okay, sweet. Yeah, we got it. Good. Okay, so cocaine does the same thing. So, cane. Uh, one of the things that we used to make, um, I used to, in the pharmacy, I would make couple of things with cocaine. <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I didn't say that today because I knew what our topic would be. But anyway, so we made a couple of different things. One of the things was we made this gel, this, this anesthetic gel that we mixed in um, it's called Surgy. It's called Surgy Lube KY Jelly. It's a lubricant. Okay, Surgy Lube is the, 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 the hospital version. And we would put it in the gel after we dissolve it. I forget what we had to dissolve it in. 
been that long. I can't remember. But anyways, so we put it in in the gel, and what we used it for, we would we would then draw it up in five ml, no one ml little syringes. And then if you came into the hospital with facial abrasions, facial cuts, they go to the they go to the cabinet, get one of these, and we'll put that right on your skin. Because the gel would then numb the nerves in your in your skin. Instead of putting an injection under your skin, cause, possibly causing more scarring. So that the cocaine also blocks, has an effect of sodium channel. And then the other thing that we used it for in another hospital was um, hemorrhoid cream. Hemorrhoid cream, that was called super cream. For uh, usually that would be used for women um, after they delivered the baby. Straining, sometimes you get some hemorrhoids. So we would use that as well. Uh, local anesthetic effect. Nobody was ever really worried about, and actually we're gonna, we'll talk about that when we talk about pharmacology, when we talk about pharmacokinetics and abuse potential because that's a good example. No one's gonna rub a bunch of uh, cocaine cream on your, you know, on your skin and try to get high from that. It's not going to happen. Try it. No, it's not going to happen. I'm so joking. Okay. So, I anyway. Have, I have one quick question about the previous slide. Go. So, that, the purple, um, the transporter, is that, is that demonstrating the um, ionotropic receptor? No. That's a transporter, so that would be. Um, everybody see the little the little region here? That would be where your neurotransmitter would bind on its way back up into the axon terminal. So it's it's it would transport the neurotransmitter back into the presynaptic neuron. Okay, that makes sense. Yep, yep. Good question. Go ahead. I'm sorry, two questions. The okay. calcium channels, they would be like on that as well, right? Yeah, they'd be down okay. in here somewhere. And then, you said the voltage gated sodium channel blockers, what cocaine and stuff, how does that affect the action potential from what? From, from being generated. They, they just don't. So, what ends up happening is that even though the neuron has been raised to the threshold, the sodium channels can't open, you, can't, you don't get the rising phase of the action potential. This is blocks it. Stops it from working. Cool. Oh, okay, good. So that this page is a really good, this is a really good page to sort of review, go over, predict, think about how drugs could possibly affect neurotransmitter release. Okay. Now we're gonna we're gonna start talking about the neurotransmitters. We're gonna talk about one, two, three, four. We're gonna talk about six. We're gonna talk about six neurotransmitters. Dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, acetylcholine, GABA, and, and glutamine. Now for the first few groups of neurotransmitters, we're going to work on, we're going to need to be familiar with how they're synthesized, starting molecule, ending molecule, what's the major rate limiting step in its synthesis, if I mention that. The neuronal pathways, where they start, where they end. What's the name of the pathway, right? Major classes of receptors, and then the general effect of activation. We may talk about some um, antagonism, which is a, another word for blockage of certain receptors. But let's let's dive in. So we're going to talk about catecholamines in general. There are two catecholamines 
neurotransmitters, dopamine and norepinephrine. So all catecholamines are going to look something like this. So they all have this catechol, this is called catechol nucleus. And then it's going to have some sort of an amine group hanging out here. Catechol amine. So I told you that there's two major, there are two catecholamine neurotransmitters, dopamine and norepinephrine, and that all synthesis of catecholamines begins with the amino acid tyrosine. So this is tyrosine here. This is, this, this is the, the building block for the catecholamines. So the first step is the conversion from tyrosine to what's called dopa. What's the difference? We add a hydroxyl group here. That's why it's called tyrosine hydroxylase, it's adding a hydroxyl group. And ultimately dopa is converted to dopamine. So in dopamine neurons, dopamine neurons would have tyrosine hydroxylase and aromatic amino acid decarboxylase. They would have these two enzymes. And dopamine then gets in, in norepinephrine neurons. Dopamine then gets converted to norepinephrine by this, um, by this enzyme dopamine beta hydroxylase. Adds a hydroxyl. It's a hydroxyl group. Um, yes? Where is tyrosine found in your body or outside of your body? Where is it It's tyrosine. That, that's an amino acid. Yep, yep. So we're going to see that all but one of the major neurotransmitters that we're going to talk about begin as amino acids. I have a quick question. Yep. Um, so what, what determines whether or not that, that third or that second to third step of dopamine becoming norepinephrine, how is that determined whether or not that process happens? That's a great question. Um, the neurons that uh, basically uh, the, easy, the easy answer is in a dopamine neuron, it's not going to have this final enzyme. It won't have this dopamine beta hydroxylase. It's only going to have the first two. So there are there are in general neurons release one neurotransmitter. There are some exceptions to that. But a dopamine neuron is typically only going to release the, the neurotransmitter dopamine. So it's only going to have the first two of these enzymes. Neurons that specifically release norepinephrine, they will have all three of these enzymes to do the whole process. Okay? So, here's a question for you. If there's a, an animal, we knock out an enzyme. We knock out one group of animals, we knock out tyrosine hydroxylase. Another group of animals, we knock out dopamine beta hydroxylase. What's the difference in neurotransmitter production? So one group of animals, I knock out tyrosine hydroxylase. This is legal, by the way. 
pretty sure. Another group of animals, I now got dopamine, beta, hydroxyl. Well, if you don't have the dopamine data on your dog's plate, then you would still have the dopamine, but you wouldn't have the norepinephrine. Everyone hear that? So if I, if I knock out dopamine beta hydroxylase, I'm still going to have dopamine. Not going to produce any norepinephrine. Done. And what about, uh, go ahead. The reason why we would still have the dopamine is because you because you still have because you haven't knocked out the tyrosine? That's correct. Yep. So in a sense, if I knock this, if I knock out dopamine beta hydroxylase, I'm gonna basically eliminate production of norepinephrine in the animal. At least in the, in the brain. What if I block, what if I knock out tyrosine hydroxylase? What happens? Done. None, none what, none what? Meaning no dopamine, no norepinephrine. Good, okay. There's a drug. <laughs> Alpha, methyl. Parathyrosine. Alpha methyl parathyrosine. Otherwise known as AMPT. Inhibits synthesis of catecholamines oh. in general. So it inhibits the synthesis of catecholamines. Did an experiment where they gave AMPT to subjects recovering who had recovered from depression. drug to subjects who had recovered from depression, AMPT, guess what happened? Their depressive symptoms immediately, well, very quickly returned. Yes. Their symptoms of depression returned, which gave researchers some important data to let them know that proper balance of catecholamine in the brain, proper neurochemistry uh, within, a, within, yeah, within the right balance is critical. Surprise, surprise for. Our behavior, right? for affect, for mood, for symptoms of depression. So, be familiar with these with these molecules. No um, main things. This is the, the major rate limiting step: the activity of tyrosine hydroxylase. Just be familiar with the fact that both dopamine and norepinephrine, they're in the same pathway, right? 
dopamine's first, then norepinephrine. And it's possible to, to knock out one without the other. Yes? Um, is that I don't think so. It's just the synthesis of catecholamine. Catecholamine can be. Yeah, it's not like Krebs cycle or something like that. No. Okay. So, well, let's talk about dopamine real quickly here. So now we're going to talk about dopamine specifically. We're going to get to major neuronal pathways, which we've talked about before at least once, maybe twice, and then the major classes of the receptors. So, dopamine. Origins of dopamine neurons are both in the tegmentum, tegmentum of the midbrain. And we talked about two major pathways, substantia nigra, and then, or two areas of origin, excuse me, the substantia nigra and the ventral tegmental area. Now, I wanted to show you, here's the, here are some brains, some human brains on the left. We've got control slice. You can see how dark we stain the substantia nigra is in this controlled person. Here's someone with Parkinson's disease. So we notice that we have a significant reduction in the staining for dopamine neurons in the right subject. Okay, substantia nigra projects. Now, by the way, what shape of brain, what kind of brain is this? Do you remember? That's a rat brain. Rat brain. Rat brain. Anyway, that's probably going to be the end of today's class. But projects into four brain structures called the striatum. And this is, we'll pick up here, this is called what, what's called the nigro striatal tract. This is the nigro striatal tract. This is part of that interacting with that group of brain areas that regulates movement, which is known as the That's a motion. That's a motion. Limit system is a motion. Basal ganglia. Yes. Thank you, Allison. And with that, we're going to pick up with dopamine. We're going to do norepinephrine. We're probably going to hit some serotonin. Maybe some acetylcholine on Thursday. Yo. Um, when I was taking the notes from the, uh, before the Zoom, I, I missed this one part. I don't know what. I'm, I'm not like that monkey in that, uh, what did you guys think about that monkey? Was that crazy or what? Yeah. That was stupid. I was thinking for other research that they like made monkeys and children go to the box to like all these different steps. And the first box was like not that bad. And then they the first the box was what? Was not that bad. Oh. They did the same thing to the second box, which was that bad. And they, 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 they could see that like half of the bad was completely unnecessary in order to open the box. And the monk is still, uh, the chicken is still made like they do all the steps, and the kids did it. They only did the steps that were necessary to actually open the box. So that's like kind of like a little bit random. Well, like, they're very monkey, they're very good at following instructions, but they're not really as good at evaluating how to do different, like how to change their behavior. Sensory powers. I mean, it's interesting. 
the monkeys are, are using their sensory powers, which are very, I mean, very strong. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. See you. All right, John, let's get you hooked up. Yeah, I don't know which. Let me, let me, let me unrecord your first. I also missed one part during today's lecture. It's um the SSRI.